Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I'm home. I'm I'm here. I actually am in a chair instead of in a random field in Texas like I probably will be in the next couple days already because uh, they're hopping next week. So, uh, guys, Rocket Lab. Uh, I don't know if you guys are as familiar and in love with Rocket Lab as I am, but I've actually been down to, I've seen both of their facilities, the one in New Zealand and the one um, in, in Long Beach or in California, or Huntington Beach or whichever the city's called. Down there in California, it's all the same place. Uh, they are honestly one of my all-time favorite companies. Everyone I've met is just super cool there, which always makes it fun. Uh, but they have my favorite black rocket, the Electron Rocket. We're gonna, I'll show you guys real quick here. Uh, I did a video about this uh, a while ago, so let me show you. Um, their rocket is, of course, the Electron Rocket. And it's a small sat launcher, so it's only launching, you know, 225 kilograms to space, uh, 496 pounds for uh, symmetrically impaired. It's 17 meters tall, 1.2 meters wide. Um, the thing is so light, you can physically push it around with just wheels. It's absolutely bonkers. Um, yeah, so the good thing is they announced that they're going to do a live stream event at a small sat conference, and the small sat conference is going on all week. And they're live streaming with an actual presentation with Peter Beck, who's their uh, their founder and CEO. And they've never done anything like this. And I wasn't going to even like bother. I was just going to watch and enjoy it myself. But the more I think about it, since they've never done anything like that, since they've never done like a public announcement, um, and they've done some really cool things already. They've already done some cool announcements. Um, they just casually drop the fact that they're like now a satellite bus manufacturer, and that's actually a really big deal. Um, but they didn't even like they didn't do anything other than just like tweet at that. Like, hey, so the fact that they're pulling out like a full keynote speech tells me that they're up to something. And uh, they're going live in about five minutes, and so I'm gonna kind of keep this ready to go. Uh, I well, we're gonna speculate here in a second what what I think it, it would be or what the options would probably be that they're going to be um, talking about and revealing today, but um, but once they're live, I'm not really gonna talk. I mean, I might like keep I might pop my face up on camera every now and then and just like react to something really quick, but I'm going to mostly let them do the talking and then we'll stick around afterwards for a little bit and talk. And then there's actually a SpaceX launch. So if you're watching this in the future, like say this is posted tomorrow live. Hi, uh, you're going to see the reaction of whatever it is that they're proposing uh, or whatever the new announcement is. And it, okay, so let's get to speculation time. Um, so as far as, okay, so they've already done like a new, they, they announced a new launch site last year that's out at Wallops. They didn't do anything other than a press, you know, a, a press release. They also, like I said, did their Photon release, which is their, I better look that up and show you guys what, what that is, because I didn't really do much on that, um, which is still cool. Um, that's where it's basically, um, uh, hang on, Rocket Lab. I gotta learn how to type and stuff. Rocket Lab, boom, boom, boom. So this is, everything they make is so pretty. That's one of, the, I think that's maybe why I like them so much. <laughs> but uh, this is their Photon, and it's it's literally like a satellite, a satellite bus. You can. Uh, launch this and it's like ready to go which is super cool um it's small it's it's neat it's basically an evolution of their kick stage that they already had um and here's the, all the specs on it to someone that builds satellites this probably means a lot more than it does to someone like me who has no idea i'm just like cool it can point i guess and do things um but so when even when they made this when they, they made this announcement they didn't do anything besides like tweet and put up this new website so that's for for that reason. I think they're doing something bigger. But let's look at what. Uh, so I did an interview with Peter Beck last year when I was down in New Zealand, and I knew not to even ask him if he's building a bigger rocket because I've seen so many of his interviews, and that's always the question: is when are you going to build a bigger rocket? And he always says, "We're not building a bigger rocket." Uh, and he's and I so I didn't even say it at the table. He could tell. I was like, "Okay." So the big question. He goes, "Don't you dare!" And I go, "No, no, no! I'm not going to ask about a bigger rocket." Because you could tell he's sick of hearing that because he knows that they're they're aiming for that, you know, 225 kilogram, to that, that small sat market. That's what they're trying to launch. There's That's a growing market. The geostationary birds are declining. They have no interest in launching humans. So we know that. So it would be unlikely that they build a bigger rocket, like definitely not stretching or like making. I don't think they're going to try to do like, oh, we went from 1.2 meters and now we have an electron two that's or electron heavy. I I don't think that would be what what it's going to be because I just don't think they they care for that market too much. They might okay. Here's 
we also talked in the interview a lot about battery technology and how how Rocket Lab is riding on the wave of, since they run on lithium ion batteries, they actually spin their pumps using electric batteries, which is really cool. Uh, it was thought to be physically impossible, and it was physically impossible just a few years ago, um, but battery technology has improved so much. And so, um, so because of that, if battery technology has improved since you know the first electron, they could maybe eke out 10% more battery capacity for the same weight. And that might in itself lead to a little bit higher capacity with the exact same like vehicle otherwise, you know, and just through some tuning, they can digitally change their payload capacity just because battery technology got better and they wouldn't have to do a thing. Like every industry in the world is competing over battery technology, right? Every all of our phones, the future of cars, the future of transportation, every laptop you own, you have 20 or 30 lithium ion batteries within 100 feet of you, I guarantee it. And, um, you know, if you think about that, they're riding that that competitive wave. So as battery technology gets better, they're going to be reaping that benefit. So who knows? It might be something as simple as like, hey, we here's our electron block 1.1 or whatever. We all we did was we changed batteries. And now guess what? We have we can now launch 300 kilograms or something. I have no idea. I'm making up numbers. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was something like that. But what a lot of people are, are wondering, well, and again, I don't think it's a launch site because they didn't, when they announced Wallops, they didn't do a live stream for Wallops. They didn't do a live stream for the satellite. So the options, because they're doing a, a website, it'd either be like some really cool customer like, or like a moon plan or something like that, I think, you know, like a blue moon type of thing, or a bigger rocket, but I don't think that's it. Um, the other option would be reuse. That could be, uh, again, maybe with higher capacity, if they have higher capacity batteries, it gives them the ability to potentially try to reuse a booster. And this vehicle is different. So um, the first stage, okay, so one of the biggest reasons why SpaceX ditched parachutes is because you have to slow the vehicle down before it hits the atmosphere. And parachutes don't work when there's no atmosphere, right? So you can't, you have to slow down before that, so you have to do uh, like some kind of entry burn anyway, propulsively. So if Rocket Lab already has, you know, if they have increased margins, here we go, they're going live here. Hang on. Let me pull this up. I'm gonna go to them a little, and we're gonna be paying attention here. Okay, so if, oh, by the way, also, if you're tuning in right now to me and you're wanting the SpaceX launch, that's coming in, uh, I'm, that's an hour from now based on, uh, they move that time a little bit. So, um, I'll try to do that live stream after this. Weather's not very go. And also, depending on what this is, say this is like something mind blowing and they're going with something really bonkers. I might skip watching, uh, expendable, you know, Falcon Heavy or Falcon 9 launch, um, depending on if this is like, let me turn that down more. Sorry, classic. I thought I turned it down enough. Um, depending on what they're, you know, if this is something super, super awesome, I might not even live stream uh, the SpaceX launch. I know, I know that's, wow. Um, so anyway, so pretend that battery technology improved, they have increased capacity. Instead of, if their market is, is firmly set at this 225 kilogram market, maybe that additional capacity would lend them the ability to do a propulsive entry, slow down. And because this rocket's so physically small, physically light, they could pop a parachute and potentially air recover it. That would be one option. Um, because it's so much smaller, if you tried to air recover a Falcon 9, you'd have to have, you know, like a two 747s flying together. I don't know. It would just be way too wily Coyote. But a rocket this size and of this lightweight, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if if they were to pursue reusability, not fully propulsively, because that's also something that in that interview, Peter Beck told me he, that he's just basically like, we don't have the margins to do propulsive landings. They're just eking this thing into orbit. They're right on the edge of what's possible. That's why they have to use things like 3D printed engines, uh, carbon fiber fuselage. Like they're already eking it into orbit. They have to ditch the upper stage batteries even. If they didn't ditch those batteries, they wouldn't even make it to orbit with any payload at all. So they're already doing all these tricks just to eke it into, into orbit. And luckily, if so, like for the upper stage, for every pound that the upper stage weighs or every kilogram that the upper stage weighs, that's a one to one ratio for what you can put into orbit. That's why you want to ditch fairings right away, because uh, if you took those fairings to orbit and then ditched them, you actually just, you know, like took off essentially, you know, a couple hundred kilograms or whatever of weight um, oh, directly countering your payload capacity. So that's not good. You want to ditch those as early as you can 
because the earlier in it, the less the earlier you ditch things, the less payload mass penalty you take. So they actually ditch the upper stage batteries um, as soon as they're drained. They do a hot swap maneuver where the upper stage batteries get dropped off. And that allows them to get into orbit. So maybe with better battery technology, maybe they're going to hot swap and ditch first stage batteries. And then that would allow them enough room to try to do the re-entry and maybe make up for some of the weight of like a parachute system or a, some wings or something. Uh, I have no idea. I will be, I'm, I'm going to be just as shocked as you guys are, whatever this announcement is. Those are my speculations. Um, I'm super excited. Again, I really genuinely love this company, and they they don't pay me to say that. Uh, they use my music though in their live streams, which is um, I I have fun with that, and I that's just I think that like I'm as a musician that just means a lot to me that a company wants to use my music. So that's the only tie I have. We don't have like any financial investments or interests in each other. I just really like this company. I think their work is stunning. I think their people are amazing. Peter Beck, the CEO, is one of the most genuine and intelligent and just like driven individuals I've ever met. Um, so this is this is exciting for me. I, I like watching a little tiny, like if you like underdogs, then you should like Rocket Lab. Um, I think that's kind of my attitude and boy, are they underdogs. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm hyping this up. Who knows, this could be a new logo. A 30 minute live stream about a new logo and it's a little bit longer or something. So I might be hyping this up a little too much. I have, I just have no idea, but I'm the fact that they're doing this, that they have a live stream and they're bringing us to this keynote, that obviously has to mean something. Um, First, oh, I do Oh, Frank Gibson, thank you. Uh, became a new member, footy nut guy. They're proposing to send Tim into space. Nope, Peter Beck has said over and over, he will not fly meat, as in he will not fly p living things. He has no interest in that. Ooh, are they starting? Yes, okay. Uh, I'm seeing, I'll get back to your comments, but Vit Ramba, I have to say, this is hilarious, says, uh, reusable SSTO for small sats with aero spikes. If they make a reusable SSTO with an aero spike engine, I, I will, what will I do? I will, I will, okay, I will donate $1,000 to a charity of popular choice on Twitter if uh, uh, some kind of aerospace t charity if they decide to go with uh, if they go with a reusable SSTO for small sats with an aerospike engine I will donate a thousand dollars to charity of your choice because I, I don't really have a thousand dollars to spend right now per se so I'm hoping that that's not the case but I just really don't think that's gonna be what happens uh, man I love these shots by the way it's so cute and small. They've flown NASA missions. It's so cool. Um, okay, and also, Dimitri, I'll bet it's a price cut, nothing more. Again, I don't think it's... Just based on the fact that they're doing all of this. Just getting up there and being like, we now announce today that instead of $5 million, a launch, launch is $4.5 million. I just don't think they would do a live stream for that at all. That'd be a press release. Three, Let's watch. One. It took me till this long to realize that they're just showing us all their different missions. 
I don't know how I didn't realize that they're going through their missions. It's crazy they've flown this much already. Like, it seems like just yesterday, what was just not even two years ago, they first went to orbit. So they've they've gotten busy. And I love how the rocket, although it's totally black, ends up taking off black and white because of all the ice that builds up on the liquid oxygen stage just from the atmosphere. And I love, I also have to say, I love their logos and their branding. Like, their, their mission patches are hilarious. Ah, uh, how can you not love this company? Okay, uh, it looks like we're going to have, I think, one more launch before before the stream starts, hopefully. This video is awesome, though. Let's see here. So pretty. Well, it's been a busy few years. And you'll notice, you'll notice we measure things in days at Rocket Lab, not months or, or years. So what have we accomplished in the last uh, 1,800 days, roughly? So uh, we started off developing a Rutherford rocket engine. Um, we've put 70 of them into space now. Uh, last month, the 100th engine came off the production line. And uh, I'm just incredibly proud of the propulsion team uh, for the engine that they've, they've created. The first uh, all 3D printed engine, first electric turbo pump cycle. There's a lot of, lot of innovations in that engine. And then there's Electron itself. As you saw from the video, we've, we've, been, to, we've been to orbit seven times. There's, there's one on the pad right now. In fact, we just finished the wet dress of that vehicle yesterday. And, uh, and, and the vehicle itself is, is proven to be 100% customer deployment success. And, uh, and we're, we're really proud of the orbital insertion accuracy that we were able to achieve. Where average, inser average insertion accuracy is around about 1.4 kilometers. And for you guys, I know that that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's pretty helpful. We're able to give state vectors to our customers within 20 minutes, and they're able to find their spacecraft straight away. There's no, no looking for spacecraft in a, in a sea. So we also built a, a launch site. Uh, this is LC-1. Um, in order for us to build this launch site, uh, we, it required a bilateral treaty between New Zealand and, uh, and America. Uh, New Zealand government had to create a whole lot of laws, then they had to create a space agency, and then the Aussies got jealous and they created a space agency too, so we created two <laughs> space agencies. But uh, nevertheless, you know, there was a massive, a massive feat. Um, we have tracking stations all around the world, Cork, Azores, uh, Chatham Island, Southland, Australia. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the site is licensed to launch every 72 hours for the next 30 years. So we have more launch frequency out of that site than, than, than most countries. And then there's LC2. Uh, we're incredibly, uh, incredibly um, proud and, and uh, working with the team at, at Mars to uh, develop LC2. Um, I think it's going to go down as the fastest launch pad build in history. We started driving piles in, uh, in January and uh, that site's going be, uh, to be activated before the end of the year. And that'll give us uh, even, even more launch frequency. And then there's production. Um, production's way harder than anybody thinks. Uh, production is super hard. And um, we've developed, you know, we've developed over four and a half acres of new factories, uh, in both in New Zealand and here in the US, to try and get to one rocket a week. Uh, we're not there yet. We're launching every 30 days, roughly right now. And, and, and some areas of the company are producing uh, their components within every 20 days. So we're marching really, really quickly to every two weeks and then, and then every week. But, uh, you know, massive amount of, of, of infrastructure build in, in factories uh, globally. And then there's Photon. Um, and Photon I'm really excited about because uh, launch for a very long time has been, uh, has been the, the bottleneck, the, the really big barrier to get ideas and innovation on orbit. And I think we're starting to get close to, to, to checking that box. The next, big, the next big hurdle for anybody to get innovation and ideas on orbit is you have to go and build your own satellite bus. And that's a, that's a very time and, and you know, expensive uh, exercise. And the whole point of Photon is to remove that barrier. It's, it, really, we think of it like a, a sandbox in, in LEO, where uh, you, can, you don't have to worry about all the satellite bit. You just come with your innovation, come with your, your payload or your sensor, and all of that other stuff is, is taken care of. And there's a launch vehicle attached to, attached to it to, go, to, you know, to boot. So no more looking for trying to source a satellite, then try and source a launch. It's all one package. And really, this this it drives all of these things drive to really this statement, and and we live and we live and die by the statement at Rocket Lab. Um, you know, we do what we say we're going to do, and you'll see throughout the history of the company, uh, very very rarely will we make an announcement where we're not really far along or already done. 
Um, the kick stage, we kind of got busted with the kick stage because people started tracking two things on orbit, so we had to announce that one. But uh, the kick stage and, uh, and then Photon, uh, you know, the first commercial Photon is uh, going on orbit by the end of the year, and we already have uh, five Photons uh, on, on orbit in early stages. Uh, from from all the all the missions that we have we, that we have flown, so generally I think that's that's the sense that um, that, that that Rocket Lab we, we do what we say we're going to do, and we, we certainly try to. So this is a Rocket Lab cap. Um, this is a cap that I'm about to eat, um, because I've said publicly a few times uh, the various things that Rocket Lab would never do. Uh -oh. um, so unfortunately, uh, I find myself in the position of eating my hat. So I'm, a, I'm an engineer at heart. Um, I'm the chief engineer for the project, and uh, really, you know, from day one, uh, it's always been about engineering for me, and um, I love building beautiful machines. In fact, I love beautiful, beautiful machines uh, all round. And throughout history, there's, there's, there's rare, rare occurrences where a beautiful machine really changes the course of human history. And I selected this picture here because it's a printing press. And before a printing press, uh, you would have to write each individual uh, article. And, Really, a printing press democratised information. Uh, a printing press, all of a sudden, you didn't have to have a one, a one handwritten bespoke thing. You could take that one handwritten bespoke thing and mass produce it and, and, and distribute it to the, the knowledge uh, to the world. So I very much love beautiful machines, and this is a great example of a beautiful machine. If you look at those Involute gear tooth profiles, they're just absolutely lovely. But even, even I have to admit, it would be pretty silly to uh, print one piece of paper and then throw this beautiful machine away. Mm. No. Are they going to air recover it? I literally guessed this I, in New Zealand when I was talking to an engineer and his face went totally blank and I was like, I might be onto something. I didn't say anything at the time, but oh my gosh. So Electron is going reusable. So let me, let me explain why I thought this was impossible. Um, so we have, a, we have a, a terminology within Rocket Lab that we affectionately call the wall. Um, and the reality is uh, we, we're not doing a propulsive uh, re-entry and obviously you saw we're not, we're not doing a propulsive landing. And the fundamental reason for that is that that takes a small launch vehicle and turns it into a medium-sized launch vehicle. And we're not in the business of building medium-sized launch vehicles, we're in the business of building small launch vehicles for dedicated customers to get on orbit frequently. So, um, a lot of things don't scale well, and that's one of the things that really don't scale well in a small launch vehicle. So we have to start off at eight and a half times the speed of sound, and we have to get down to 0 0.01 times the speed of sound in around about 70 seconds. And that's a really challenging thing to do. There's a lot of energy that needs to be dealt with on the way down. So we need to dissipate around about 3.5 gigajoules of energy. That's a lot of energy to deal with on the way down. And to put it into, into more context, 3.5 gigajoules powers 57,000 homes for an instant. That kind of gives you a sense of, of how much energy that we have to scrub. And we can't scrub that propulsively. And when we're entering, we, get, we generate a lot of shock waves and shock-shock interactions, and the plasma around those shock waves is equal to about half the temperature of the sun. So we have tremendous you know, aerothermal loads. I think you can probably see by now why I thought this was a pretty big challenge prior, prior to this. 
And then the aerodynamic loads, it's like, it's like taking an electron and standing three elephants on the top. Um, so you have a 1.8 millimeter carbon fiber rocket uh, with three elephants standing on the top uh, with heating loads half the temperature of the sun uh, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at eight and a half times the speed of sound. And we've got to get it down safely and, and in one piece. So there's lots of really big challenges here to try and deal with. So why did we convince ourselves, how do we convince ourselves this was possible? Well, we started flying. And when we started flying, we started getting more and more data. The Electron is, is, is basically a flying laboratory. We have around about 15,000 channels of data every flight. So we, we collect a huge amount of data every flight. And, and once you start to collect that data, we started to build these computational fluid dynamic models. And we, try, we tried to understand and close the verification loop of what's going on. What you see there is a CFD model of a stage at the beginning of, of re-entry. And then you can see the kind of flow fields you get as, you, as you're trying to re-enter here and the kind of interactions um, with, with the vehicle and, uh, and, and the atmosphere. This is a particularly interesting CFD plot. This shows all the shock-shock interactions. So when, when you produce one of those shock waves which is white, that's just think of that as the sun or half the temperature, temperature of the sun. And you'll notice a few of those shock waves on this particular angle of attack of re-entry at 10 degrees are attaching themselves to the launch vehicle. That is a plasma knife. Um, so that is a very difficult thing uh, to deal with, uh, both from a TPS perspective, but also from a, from a re-entry control perspective. So this is a hard, hard problem. Uh, and we're, we're, we're taking a, you know, a completely different approach to, uh, to solving, this, uh, solving this problem. Um, we're, we're doing it uh, very, very passively. Um, we're doing it with a lot of uh, TPS and a lot of aerodynamic uh, decelerators to try and uh, push our way uh, through that, bound, that boundary wall. So if we think about what, what is our plan here? Um, so uh, we started flying um, uh, in, in earnest, you know, commercially end of last year. And that's when we started to gather data. And um, more, more recently, we've really started to nail down on this. So flight six, we, we gathered a lot of data. Uh, flight seven, we gathered even more data. This flight eight that's coming up, that's on the pad, is a really critical flight. So this flight eight has uh, an advanced uh, data recorder system that we've, uh, we've named Brutus. And it's named Brutus because really Brutus rides the stage all the way through atmospheric re-entry, all the way through those regimes. And the, spray, the stage will break up um, and it's going to ride that stage all the way down and splash into the ocean. Then we're going to pick that thing up and uh, it's a super high fidelity data recorder so we'll have a lot, of, a lot more uh, understanding of the environment. And then we can use all that information to validate our, um, our CFD models and all, all of our other trajectory models. And for Flight 10, we have a major upgrade for Electron. So there'll be uh, some, some pretty major changes uh, on Electron. But if you're flying on us, uh, don't anybody panic, uh, because any, all of these upgrades are completely standalone uh, to Electron. They don't interface with any of the, the current flight systems. They're all, they're all passive. So um, although we are adding new systems to the vehicle and experimenting, they, they, have, uh, they, they certainly do no harm systems. And then you'll notice that I put flight in um, on there for the first uh, recapture. Um, and I'm reluctant to, to name a flight uh, because you know, we, still have to, we still have to get through the war. Um, and then the goals here, we've, we've kind of broken this up into two main goals. Um, goal one is just to get through the wall. And I bet a lot of you guys were, you know, were sitting there watching and, and, and looking at the helicopter piece thinking, whoa, that's tricky. Um, but as a, as a budding helicopter pilot, I can assure you that is the least bit that I'm worried about. Um, that bit is super easy. Um, getting through the wall is, is really, really hard. We've developed uh, quite a lot of new technologies and new techniques um, to, be able to, uh, to be able to manage this, so we think we've got a, a really good shot at, at making this happen. And then once we're through the wall, well, we go and pick it up. Um, and uh, the, the ideal scenario here is, as everybody's aware, Electron is a, an electric turbo pump vehicle. So the, the, the grand goal here is if we can, if we can capture the vehicle uh, in, in wonderful condition, uh, in theory, we should be able to put it back on the pad, charge the batteries up, and go again. That's the, that's the, the main uh, ideal goal. So why, why, do, why do this, this recovery? Why, why, why the change and why are we trying to, trying to attempt this? And it comes down to this, this fundamental fact. Launch frequency is the absolute key here. Launch frequency is the thing that is going to change this industry and quite frankly uh, going to change uh, the world because if we can get these systems up on orbit uh, quickly and reliably uh, and frequently, uh, we, can, we can innovate a lot more and, uh, and create a lot more opportunities. So launch frequency uh, is really the main driver for why Electron is going reusable. Um, and in time, hopefully, we, we can obviously reduce prices as well. But the, the, fundamental, uh, you know, the fundamental reason we're doing this is, is uh, launch frequency. Even if I can get the stage back once, 
I've effectively doubled my production ratio. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a wonderful place to be. So thanks very much for everybody uh, turning up and thanks for very, very everyone uh, watching uh, this live. If, uh, if for the people here at uh, SmallSat, um, it's time to party. So uh, please come to the Rocket Lab party and uh, we'll celebrate this, but thank you very much. So, okay. <laughs> Uh, we have a lot to talk about here, guys. Uh, I'm already seeing a lot of people obviously comparing this to uh, to the smart reuse system that ULA uh, proposes with the upcoming Vulcan rocket. Uh, someone said ULA did it first. Uh, ULA has yet to actually fly a Vulcan, let alone attempt their smart reuse. Um, so whoever does it first does it first. Um, this is really exciting. <laughs> this uh, re Recovering things via parachute and then swooping it out of the air is not unheard of. Uh, the Corona satellites back in the day, spy satellites, they literally would eject a little like miniature capsule with all the film in it. Uh, they would deorbit themselves. They would pull a parachute and then a, a helicopter, or actually I think it was actually a, a plane, would fly with a tow hook or a hook and swoop it out of the sky. And the cool thing is with that system, a fun side note, is if they missed and if the thing would splash down and they couldn't find it or re, you know, re-enter it in the wrong place and they never were able to retrieve it, it had this salt plug. So it was you know, a, a buoyant ball, but it had this plug in it that was made out of salt. So it would sit on the surface for a couple hours or whatever, and if no one went to recover it, it would automatically dissolve that salt plug, and then the thing would sink to the bottom of the ocean. And that is obviously, uh, if they would miss it, you know, on, on air recovery, it would give them a little bit of time to be able to grab it if they, you know, oh, there it is, go down and, and pick it up. But it also made it so if they didn't know where it was and it accidentally landed in enemy territory or closer to, you know, shore or something, uh, that it wouldn't be accidentally recovered by, uh, by enemy forces. So, you know, things like this, recovering things via parachute, swooping them out of the sky isn't unheard of. The funny thing is, I actually... Th honestly thought this was coming only because there was like two pictures on Rocket Lab's website a long time ago that had uh, a helicopter. And I don't know why, like it was a helicopter out of the launch pad. And I don't know why that stuck with me. I was always like, that's so weird that they're showing off a helicopter. And it would like kind of be in the background just hanging out. And I know it's literally probably just how they got to and from, but I, 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 I wonder if that's why I always was thinking, oh, they're just going to try to recover it for a helicopter. You might ask, why not? Why isn't SpaceX doing something like this? Let me let me show you a real quick comparison of how big the Falcon 9 is compared to the Electron. So um, here's here's the uh, Falcon 9, right? And scroll down. You know this thing's 70 meters tall. That's the Electron. <laughs> it's not much bigger than one of the landing legs uh, of a Falcon 9 rocket. So if you imagine how big of a helicopter or airplane or jetliner it would take to recover the first stage of this vehicle via parachutes and air, uh, like swooping it out of the air versus something like an Electron. I mean, that's already a big helicopter that's swooping the Electron out of the sky. I just don't think there's an airworthy vehicle that exists that could physically pull <laughs> safely uh, a Falcon 9 first stage booster around with its you know parachute and all that stuff. So, um, so, th so the fact that's pretty much the main reason why they could potentially recover these with um, a helicopter is is because of the physical size of the vehicle. It's small enough to be able to recover, be recovered by a decent sized vehicle, right? And so that's awesome. I'm shocked that they don't have to slow down at all or have air control surfaces. Let's. I wonder if I still have this up on YouTube because I would like to actually watch that little thing again, quick. Um, the fact that they make it seem like they don't even need, um, let's just watch this animation one more time. I was pretty, pretty <laughs> shocked when they played it. So I don't think I was paying that much attention, but I'm just going to pull this up. Let's rewatch this.
Okay, so, so things that I missed that first time. Uh, I don't know. I'm just seeing a bunch of comments. Something that's really interesting. Let me pull this up quick. Uh, <laughs> Joe Wakefield in our Discord showed me this is the most bonkers thing I've ever seen in my life. I have never seen this before, but apparently NASA at one point was going to try to do something um, like this. Hold on. Let me pop it up here. <laughs> so that what you're seeing there is the first stage of a Saturn V launch vehicle, so 10 meters wide, so 33 feet wide, being flown around by easily the largest helicopter ever made by a landslide. <laughs> what? I don't think this couldn't have been an air recovery situation because there's no way that thing is going to grab onto it like that. That had to have just been a transportation idea. Um, that's plain bonkers. Um, and you might ask something like, uh, you might be asking yourselves or me or someone maybe talking to your sibling or something, why isn't SpaceX doing air recovery for their fairings, right? Well, there's something here because, you know, the, the, uh, trying to grab onto something like a little rocket like this, it, the surface area is relatively small. It's relatively dense, you know, it's, even though it's empty, the fuel, you know, is so much lighter than it was at liftoff, um, but, you know, it's basically just some engines and then a, a narrow tube. As opposed to trying to, you know, catch something that's large surface area, lightweight, is basically its own sail. I'll bet you the fairing is actually probably heavier than an empty first stage electron uh, on a Falcon 9 to begin with. And then you have all those additional aerodynamic forces. So for SpaceX, it probably makes the most sense to not try to swoop it out of the air. Uh, something that as soon as you do catch it, you've got this huge, huge thing with a ton of aerodynamic surfaces. Uh, but yeah, there's been, I mean, there's been, um, no way. They were trying to recover it like that. That's crazy. Huh. Joe Wakefield, let's, we're going to probably end up doing a video about this. I didn't, how on earth could they have recovered that thing out of the sky like that? That's, that's bonkers. Now that's doing it the Kerbal style. <laughs> um, I would love to do this, uh, Ben, Chris, Chris two ball, crystal ball, Chris two ball. Um, uh, did this is uh, asking me to do it in KSP. I would love to do it in KSP. The only problem is I don't think you can get something to interact with a parachute. A parachute's like a non thingable, grabbable. Maybe you can do it now with the new expansion. I don't even have a decent working helicopter in the expansion. Otherwise, maybe I'll try and do it for the video. Um, what do you guys think? Should I like not even live stream tonight's SpaceX launch if it happens to go? Um, Whoa, Declan Murphy already from from Flight Club. Um, <laughs> whoa, okay, hang on, Declan, hit me with hit me with what you got here, my friend. Um, if you guys don't know who Declan Murphy is, uh, he runs this website called FlightClub.io. He already because he's a literal genius, um, already pulled up an acceleration graph with an aero model of what this might look like. Declan, I love you. Um, look at this. So, Declan, hit me with an actual link if you got one. Okay, he's got one already. <laughs> God, Declan. You're the best. Um, and he says that it looks like peak, with his approximate aero models, his, the peak G-forces would be about 12 Gs, which would be uh, pretty bonkers. So let me copy this quick. Um, take a look at this. So look at, this is, Declan did this in the meantime. <laughs> like, he did this just, let me... Check this out. Um, so we have everything here. We have aerodynamic pressure, um, which is, that's max Q on reentry. It's not that much higher than max Q on ascent. Uh, that's pretty interesting. And we have things like um, thrust. You know, obviously they cut out thrust and this is crazy. Drag coefficients. How do you do this? Who, who gets this smart in their lifetime <laughs> to do this stuff? Okay, so there's the first stage deaccelerating, and it peaks out at, at 11 Gs is what I'm seeing for a peak. Um, oh, air, and the aerodynamic pressure. Yeah, that's crazy. Everyone, really quick, if you like what you just witnessed, which is a real-time analysis 
of <laughs> of something like this, um, please go to patreon.com slash flight club. Let's see what let's see if that's his thing. Um, because this is the type of stuff. Um, become a supporter of Declan. People that are doing stuff like this in their free time just because it's awesome and people like me and other creators and you, if you're interested in type of stuff, you can use this if you're a photographer and want to capture a rocket launch and know exactly where it's plotted. This is what Declan Murphy's for here, my friends. Uh, look at this. Yeah, so anyway, become a, a supporter of Declan Murphy Flight Club. Um, where he's 65% complete to this his goal here. Um, yeah, and that would be awesome. I, I use this website all the freaking time. Hey, Declan, by the way, uh, I'm talking to you right now. Uh, I need your help. I'm working on an aerospike video, and I need you to help me run some numbers on delta V and uh, mass fractions if we were to use the RS-2200 versus the RS-2500 on the Venture Star. I'll get back to you on that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So, so there's the brilliance of a man named Declan Murphy and Flight Club. So I'll be, I'll be using that like literally probably tonight. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you guys think I should make a video about this and, and kind of do like a why hasn't anyone done it before video? Uh, or do you think I should try to live stream? I, I'll probably interrupt my Aerospike video because my Aerospike video is at 11 pages, um, which is probably about 30 minutes of content and I still have at least three or four more pages. So that's becoming a long, 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 long video with a lot of technical data, a lot of good charts and graphs. Um, I still probably have a solid three or four days of scripting and research to really finish up on that video. So I won't even get that done for two, three weeks at this point. Um, otherwise, I could probably crank out something like this, a pretty easy topic that will do a few historical things. Um, yeah, um, let, me know, let me know. Do you guys want me to do... Um, yeah, SpaceX, people want me to do this SpaceX stream still. Um, going big, catching the Saturn V. All right, thank you, Chris. Also, I wanna make sure I'm saying hi to the people that, that sent me a tip. Thank you, guys. Um, Dimitri, I bet it's a price cut. Yeah, we talked about that. Not a price cut. Well, maybe someday. Maybe someday they can lower, lower the cost if they're recovering the first stage. Uh, Jack, what's my opinion on Arian next? Uh, Callisto or Callisto and uh, Themis, Themis. Honestly, I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen anything on Ariane Next really, uh, besides the Ariane Six. But uh, they had a, a cool reusability concept a little bit ago. But I don't know anything about those other two things. Um, yeah, uh, this, that's my opinion. I guess. Unfortunately, Riley, uh, are we all still on for the Midwest meetup? Riley, guess who's interrupting my Midwest meetup potential? SpaceX because I am leaving for Texas on Friday already. I was hoping to do it. This would have been the weekend that I was going to try to do it, but now I'm heading back down to Texas to see Starhopper hop 200 meters because they're targeting that on Monday already. Looks like I'll never sleep in my bed again. Uh, so Midwest meetup will be on hold until I'm settled because then after that, the 24th, they're supposedly doing um, the announcement SpaceX is. So I'll probably likely be doing that. I will, maybe I'll try to fit, depending on how long I'm down in Texas, I may try to fit a Midwest meetup in between those two things. If not, it's probably getting pushed to September. Sorry, I'm the worst. Uh, Gustav, thanks for making such awesome content. You're welcome. Thank you for tipping. Captain Chris, I learned so much watching you explain stuff and really appreciate it. It's given me a whole new appreciation for what these companies are able to accomplish. Hey, that's awesome, Captain Chris. Thank you very much. Um, that's, that's literally like my whole thing is that I, this stuff still blows my mind. And the more I learn, the more I appreciate. Like I'm very heavy into uh, what is that Moore's not Moore's law. Um, what's that one law where you realize how dumb you are? <laughs> the Dunning Kruger effect. Like where I, I realize uh, like five years ago when I was just watching SpaceX from the side, I was like, Pfft, and I thought I knew like everything. And then I started diving into the stuff, and I'm just like, the people that work on the stuff are utterly brilliant, you know. So I'm still constantly in that state. So I'm glad that 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 uh, gets rubbed off because <laughs> that's just. That's just me, like constantly blown away with the engineering these people are doing. Um, Chris Harris, Rocket Lab is only responding to SpaceX killing them. I, this isn't the type of thing that you do because SpaceX announced this week about a small sat competition. Uh, SpaceX now is, is basically undercutting the previous rideshare company um, by basically half by doing their own ride sharing 
which uh, that is very competitive, and that was very competitive to Rocket Lab. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Rocket Lab's reuse plans here make it a lot more competitive and and potentially even um, undercutting SpaceX's costs someday. Who knows? Um, the fallen one in our Discord asked, when's the 200 meter launch? It's supposed to happen on Monday. Um, Equin, hey Tim. In the thumbnail, they look like a used rocket salesman. Maybe now I can be because they'll have some used rockets. That's insane. Rocket Lab, promise me at the end of the life of a certain booster that I could buy one. Please just sell me a booster when it's after you recover it. That would be amazing. Thank you. Um, uh, also, keep up the good work. I can't wait to see the aerospace video. Yeah, that's definitely going to be... This is turning in... It's not as big of a, a snowball effect as the... Uh, as a full flow stage combustion Raptor video, but the Aerospike video has become a lot more than I thought it was. Like, I thought I knew the answer. I thought I knew, like, I thought I had a really good idea of why Aerospikes really haven't really been used that much. I, I, I've i gone up and down in emotions and my opinion on them back and forth from vile hatred to, oh, we're close actually, to maybe that's worth it, to like, no, this is dumb again, to like, no wonder they're not being used. I still have these big fluctuations in, in my own opinions. Um, so that's my, even the title of the video is going to change from why I always suck to whatever I conclude by the end of the video. <laughs> I don't actually know yet. That's how uh, far along I am, I guess. Um, let's see here. Uh, Footy Nut Guy. Oh, also, Jeffrey, thank you very much. Um, oh, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, Jeffrey. Keep it up. I really enjoy interacting in real time. Good, Jeffrey. I like, I do like live streams a lot. This is still one of my favorite things to do just because, I mean, being able to, yeah, uh, react in real time. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, though. Um, Footy Nut Guy, NASA tried this with a sample return mission. Good note. Hey, remember this, Discord. If someone in our Discord could make, like, a, a note with notes that we were talking about, um, yeah, let's... Uh, Let's make sure we talk about that NASA mission that, that did not be successfully recovered. Um, that's a really good idea. Uh, Dimitri, it's it's fall on shoots from around 10 minutes from helicopter altitude to sea level. Impossible to catch on time. I don't know if I agree there. I mean, SpaceX is able... Why do you think a helicopter can't do it? SpaceX is able to get a slow boat underneath a fairing. Why can't a fast helicopter that's already in the near proximity on a boat, get there. I mean, it's not, nope, you're wrong. Sorry, Dimitri. <laughs> um, I think that's no problem. Uh, John Hollerman, the Falcon 1 had parachute recovery tests, and I think the idea is canceled, and you know enough about that to compare them. That's what we're definitely going to compare it to is the Falcon 1. Well, and Falcon 9 recovery attempts. They packed parachutes in the interstage of the Falcon 9. I don't think they ever got to the point of even trying to do Falcon 1 recovery because they immediately pretty much went to recovery attempts on Falcon 1, and they couldn't slow it down enough to survive re-entry. So, um, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do a comparison. That's a really good one to compare to. We'll compare basically to all other recovery attempts. Um, Feltrick, uh, Garmand, can't they, like, push out some kind of th thing from the bottom, like services to create a counter shockwave that cancels the plasma knife? Um, felt, uh, so Feltrick, the problem with, uh, like the plasma, <laughs> the plasma, uh, uh, plasma knife basically is, yeah, you, you, anytime you introduce some kind of interference with that, I mean, it's, it's just really hard. That stuff's crazy hot and it's really hard to control that type of stuff. So, um, I don't know what they could push out from the bottom that would be able to move that. So, because the problem is if you're actually moving that shock wave around, now you're steering the vehicle. That's the same thing as like an aerodynamic surface. So say you put something out front and you have it like try to bend that, the shock wave around, guess what? That's going to apply a force that flips the stage around. It's basically putting an aerodynamic surface up front, which is generally a very, very bad idea. Um, SPL, uh, SPFLSU, quick, how much lower would launch cost be? Love your videos. I don't have a good estimate for that. Um, we could maybe make a guess of like they might be able to go half cost because the you know the first stage of the rocket clearly is over half the cost of the rocket by a large mar you know margin as far as hardware goes it's by far the most expensive part it has nine engines as opposed to one it has the most carbon fiber it has the most batteries just recovering that stuff and bringing it back home 
um, has to be a dramatic decrease in the physical costs of the material. Um, I don't know if that directly correlates to, you know, say that's 90% of the cost of the vehicle. Can that be half the price of for launch? Because there's still a lot of fixed costs. There's still a lot of, you know, human labor time and fuel and range and all that stuff. Can that lower the cost to the customer by half or just at least increase their, their margin on it? It could definitely increase the profit margin, but they might find that they could potentially have a fewer amount of customers if they're not lowering the cost in the near future. So who knows? Good questions to know that they probably only have the answers to. Uh, Chris Kibb, hi, West, hi, Wesley Crusher, love your science and stuff. Well, thank you. I don't know what a Wesley Crusher is, but thank you. And I like science and stuff too. <laughs> um, okay, Footy Nut Guy, NASA Stardust tried this in 2006. It failed. There we go, Stardust. We will check it out. Um, thank you very much for that footy nut guy. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think if something failed once, it doesn't mean that it's a failed concept. And that's that's the thing that I had to learn for myself about the Aerospec video. And Aerospecs haven't really failed. That's the thing. We actually had, we've had very good working prototypes. Just at the end of the day, are they better than a traditional bell-shaped nozzle? Um, so saying that something failed once is just like saying SpaceX failed to recover their first Falcon 9, so it's not going to work ever. Obviously, that's now in the in the past. Um, um, I know I don't watch the next generation. I'm sorry. Um, Dustin, yes, I will get to KSP at some point. That'll probably be. I'll just do that exclusively with. Uh, um, yeah, I'll I'll probably do that for our uh, for our patrons here as I try to see if I can can do this, replicate this in Kerbal Space Program. Um, by the way, the reason I'm, the main reason I don't do Kerbal on my YouTube channel that much anymore is because every time I do, like people get mad at me for playing a game. It's like, hey, first off, let me do my own thing. I can do whatever I want. I'm a grown adult. You cannot click on the video if you don't want to, but also it's a fun perk for those people that are uh, Discord members and, and Patreon supporters to, to join in on and have a little exclusivity. So um, yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, uh, Ear, Ear J asks, Tim, how is SpaceX going to handle the zero-G flight to Mars without causing its passengers physical damage, similar to what happened to Scott Kelly? I don't have that answer. A good Mars transit is like six months. Um, we can probably get it down to like five months, th four months, and that's a lot less time in space than, that's a pretty standard stay in space before you're standing on the surface of Mars. And once you're standing on the surface of Mars, hopefully... You know, you don't have all those plugging issues. So that's probably the main reason is just you're not spending two years in space um, or in zero G. You're spending uh, like a six month ride at max and then another six month ride. Maybe the body's perfectly fine with it. Um, and it might be a little bit of physical damage. And that's just a risk that those astronauts have to decide if that's worth it to them. Um, uh, Equin wants to know if, if Tori Bruno changed my opinion a little bit because I respect the crap out of that guy. And um, I mean, I... Yeah, I, I started looking. I had to sometimes remember that it's easy for me to villainize or for all of us to villainize an idea or a concept or a project and forget that the people working on those aren't stupid, period. Like, number one. And then when you actually have a face to that, like, oh, I know Tori Bruno. I like Tori Bruno. I respect Tori Bruno. He worked on VentureStar and he worked on, the, you know, directly with the XRS 2200 linear aerospike engine. He clearly has experience with this. And he, his opinion, I would I would value that. He has experience. He's done it. Like, what have I done? Made some YouTube videos, you know, farted on the couch and, and ran around looking at rockets in Texas. Like, I, I'm not one to, to doubt someone's, you know, career's work. <laughs> like, I don't have that opinion. I don't, you don't have that opinion. When people are like, oh, this is dumb. Like, do the research. Let's see where the research takes you. Do, do some engineering time behind it. So I have varying opinions on the aerospike, and we're going to let both of those play out in this script that's now becoming an eternity long. Okay, so um, Saturn V recovery for a stage in KSP. I think that's getting a little bit, a little, a little long. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, o O O L H Z N space balloons. I never know how to how I'm supposed to say that. Uh, money towards buying a rocket lab booster. Thank you. I will I will buy one someday. You'll see. You'll see. I'll put it in my living room. I think that'd be the coolest thing to hang up over. That'd be so cool. 
<laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, Luke Warren, thank you. Jack T-Rex, um, where did that go? I hate when it does that. This is the, the competition the aerospace industry has needed. You're exactly right. Uh, Riley says, all good. I can meet up anytime. Got to pack my L2 rocket beforehand, though. I like that idea. I don't know what exactly an L2 rocket is, though. But yes, deal. Stumpy001, please stop by the Lab Padre YouTube live stream while you're in, in a Texas SpaceX hop. I will, I'll do that. I would definitely do that. That'd be, that'd be a ton of fun. Um, I could do that way before you know, my own stream when I'm down there for the, for the hop. I would love to stop in and say hi to you guys. It's been, I love having all the coverage from, from Lab Padre and from, um, from S Padre Cam and all the, oh, you guys are doing great work and it's been awesome to be able to watch the progress. So, um, Tizwig, TFC, what's the fastest turnaround that you think they might be able to get? I honestly have no idea. The good thing about a vehicle this small is just physically moving it around is a lot easier. It can just be on the back of like a flatbed truck basically and shipped around even on the narrow streets of New Zealand. A lot easier than say trying to take a, you know, 45 meter long booster with that needs a convoy uh, around and, and driving it around New Zealand eight hours from headquarters to the launch pad. Uh, it's just a lot easier than uh, physically easier than it is to do that uh, with a larger booster. So their turnaround time could potentially be very, very quick. Um, Aomar, what's our where they go? The first rule of Dunning Kruger Club: you don't know you're in the Dunning Kruger Club. So true, so true. So I guess I'm beyond step one. I'm at the point of admitting it. I guess. Uh, not Heisenberg. Stardust forgot to deploy parachute units. Units conversion. That's right. Yes. Yep. So uh, yeah, that's not to say it's impossible because it was just an error. Uh, Chris Harris, viable potato, 22-year-old scotch fuel rockets for the wind. I almost have no idea what you're talking about, but yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Ben Shea, keep doing what you do. Thank you, Ben. That's going to go directly towards my hotel costs <laughs> for Boca Chica. Uh, they went up a lot. Uh, it's a long story, but I now will be staying. I'm going to try to stay in closer um, this time, because driving back and forth and stuff like that, um, I found a, another option, and it's just kind of expensive to have to buy a hotel for three, four, five nights, plus the four nights to get down there and back. So thank you very much. Um, I love what I do, and I wouldn't be doing it without you guys. Um, oh, Ariel in our Discord says, uh, uh, L2 rocket is a high-level power model rocket certification. Uses rocket motors that are either J, K, or L class. Sweet. Okay. I didn't realize that that's what happens when you get to that. Got it. Um, not Heisenberg. Sorry, wrong failure. Uh-oh. Not the units conversion failure. Okay. Noted. I'll, I'll do my own research on that uh, for this video. Corona Kivo. Are you going to live stream the AML 17 launch? I was thinking about it. Hopefully, I don't cancel due to weather. Um yeah, we'll we'll see. I'm supposed to start that in like five minutes. Um, we'll see. Landing is likely to use more. Okay, so uh, Brant, I'm going to South Potter to see the next SpaceX text next week. That's so cool. What is a good place for public viewing? Brant, you can go all the way down to the very southern tip of uh, South Padre, and there's a there's a whole park there that's public, south facing. You'll be within like five miles. It'll be eight kilometers away from it. And at 200 meters in altitude, you'll definitely see it. I mean, you will definitely see it from there and hear it. So that's where I'd go. Go to the very southern tip of South Padre on Monday and you will see it, assuming it goes off then. Uh, good luck, Brant. I'm really hoping I have time this time. Say this doesn't get into some long stretch of time where I have to zip off and, and, and ditch uh, South Padre really quickly or that area, Brownsville, Boca Chica. Um, I do want to do a meetup, so stay tuned on Twitter. Um, yeah. Uh, Wolvenhard was curious if you could do a video on space garbage on, and the CO2 rocket launch costs. I, uh, Wolvenhard, you're already, I'm doing a whole environmental impact of rockets video. That's another one of those long ones that's going to take a lot of research. Um, I, I did a thing. Gosh, I need to get better at just like taking people up on those offers, but I would definitely love a research assistant, someone that's done the environmental impact stuff and, and is good at reading like environmental impact studies. Um, someone that has experience with things like, uh, you know, the transportation industry as a whole, looking at CO2 output, all that stuff. 
you have any interest in that, uh, hit me up, info at everydayastronaut.com. Uh, I want to experience people, though. I, I, I need to be able to rely on these numbers with my life. <laughs> so uh, hit me up. You're very, very serious. Um, and if you've had good experience doing research, um, specifically on environmental impacts, that would be amazing. So, um, yeah. And let's see. Uh, uh, so that's coming up. Chris Harris, another $2 for the Force Tim to Mars Fund. No, don't make me do it. Thank you. Chris, uh, CRS-18 landing. I thought they normally come back over water before moving over, over to LZ-1, but this one appeared directly over land. I wasn't sure they had permission to do it this way. It's hard to tell the difference between velocity vector and pointing vector. Physically, it's pointing over land, you know, but the, the trajectory, the whole way after the entry burn to the landing, they're pointing themselves trying to get to land and they're dog-legging there. You, it, that's just the way it always is. It's not like, it looks like it's like way overhead. It's just very deceiving. And the onboard cameras make it look like it's like, the whole time it's over water. And if at any time it fails, it will go splat right into the water, just like CRS-16 did. But yeah. Um, Ryan says, check out the pics in Discord. We've got lots of pics in Discord. What What is this one about though? The I don't get what, what... The fact, that, oh yeah, I know we've got we've got two rockets on the launch pad right now, which is super 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 sick. Um, yeah. All right, and then Luke Warren, thank you, Ryan. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to get out of here and make a decision on whether or not to work on this video or try to do the SpaceX live stream. Um, yeah. Uh, if you want to help do what I do, guys, be sure and check out. Uh, where is that? You can go to my web store. I have a lot of new stuff. I really, you guys need to get in here because some of these things are going to sell out quickly. Uh, these are already being shipping soon. I love these shirts. Uh, we haven't sold as many of, th of these as I thought. These are going to be awesome shirts. They do have that little cool patch that's so on patch now. Uh, so if you guys want these, be sure and get these now before we run out of them. So uh, hit these up. This is everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Uh, we also have the new pointy end, flamey, pointy end up, flamey end down shirts. I'm super in love with these. And then these are coming back in the store soon. We did sell out of these almost immediately. So if you, uh, if you want these, these are shipping already. Most of these, if you order these, you probably have it in hand by now. Uh, but we're doing another run of them, which will hopefully be, we'll hopefully have them in store really soon. And I'll let you guys know. Uh, but be sure and check that out often. And also, we're getting grid fins back very soon. Um, all that fun stuff. So, yeah, uh, if you want to help support what I do, the most fun way is to shop. Uh, these are also, some of these are sold out already, some sizes. So, you know, make sure you, if you want something like this all over print, uh, check this stuff out. Get it while you see it because it might not be there next time you go. Um, I can't promise that. We don't do print on demand. We do runs of shirts. So they're higher quality and lower prices for you guys. And we can do cool things like the sew on patches and stuff like that. To me, this is what makes these shirts so cool now. It's like, sew on patches? Are you kidding me? And they say, like, Apollo, Command. They're all individualized. Like, this is... I'm trying to take the game up a lot here. These are these are awesome. And then the other fun thing to do, uh, if you want to join our exclusive Discord channel or our exclusive Discord, go to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. I'm also working on membership um, membership things here in, uh, in YouTube that will link it to Discord at a $10 tier. It's still not what it needs to be and i'm waiting for the beta to kind of finish up on that and then um certain tiers of members will have access to discord as well um so if you're uh, a current member i'll have different rates for this the match up to our patreon tiers as well um so if you want to do that that will be an option but otherwise patreon.com slash everyday astronaut if you want to join our awesome discord community um do that now i'm going to head out of here guys and i'm going to decide what to do <laughs> with our time here um so, oh, and, and not Heisenberg says it was, it was Genesis, uh, S and C and a guidance, uh, upside down accelerator. Thanks for chat. Apparently Stardust was successful. Okay. I'll, I'll read into it. Sounds good. All right. Thank you guys. Uh, I may be right back in like a matter of minutes with a SpaceX live stream. So we'll see. It's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut bringing space down to earth for everyday people.